It's time for the three question warm up for Biochem 4. Let's get going. What are the most common causes of meningitis in the following age ranges? Uh, so first we have in the newborns. So in the newborns and the young infants, this is gonna be group B strep, E. coli, and listeria. In children six months, six years, you have a strep pneumo. You're gonna have strep pneumo all across the age ranges, really moving on from here on. Uh, in this age range of children, you also have Neisseria meningitis also, also H. influenza, and uh, enteroviruses. Enterovi enteroviruses are actually being the most common cause of aseptic meningitis uh, in this age range. And the most common cause of a bacterial meningitis in this age range, again, is strep pneumonia. From six years to 60, you have strep pneumonia again. You also have Neisseria meningitis. You also have enteroviruses here and HSV. Uh, what type of encephalitis does HSV cause? Remember, that's that temporal lobe encephalitis. We're talking about meningitis, uh, but uh, the two can overlap. Now, uh, over age 60, you have strep pneumonia again. Gram-negative rods start to show up and listeria. So listeria shows up in the very young and the very old. Next question, what is the mechanism of action of dantrolene? Well, dantrolene prevents the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum of skeletal muscle. Next question, what substances inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine? So that's going to be cocaine and the tricyclic antidepressants. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. If you're watching these videos in order, we just finished talking about transcription of DNA to make RNA. Now we're going to take that mRNA and we're going to translate it into a protein. So let's start by setting aside mRNA for a moment and let's look at tRNA. tRNA is very important in the translation of proteins or polypeptides. tRNA has a very unique cloverleaf structure which you need to be able to identify. Burn that image into your mind. Now, in order to start building a polypeptide, you need to attach an amino acid to each tRNA molecule. We say that the tRNA has been charged with an amino acid, and we call that molecule aminoacyl tRNA. The enzyme that does the charging is called aminoacyl tRNA synthetase, and that's an enzyme worth knowing. That charging process requires energy, so this uses ATP. A molecule of tRNA has a 3' prime end and a 5' prime end. The three prime end is the hydroxyl end, and it always ends with the sequence CCA, cytosine, cytosine, adenine. This is the end at which the aminoacyl tRNA synthetase works. That's another point you definitely need to know, so let me say it again. Aminoacyl tRNA synthetase works at the three prime end. So the amino acid is attached to the tRNA molecule at the three prime end so that it can be used to generate the polypeptide. Once you have your tRNAs all charged and ready to go, you can start translating mRNA and building polypeptides. So, where do the mRNA and tRNAs come together? Well, they come together in the ribosome. The ribosome is like a little protein factory within the cell. There are tons of ribosomes found on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is what makes the rough ER look rough. There are also ribosomes found in the cytosol. It's also worth noting where ribosomes are synthesized. You might think that ribosomes would be synthesized in the cytosol, since that's where they're going to be working, but they're not. Ribosomal subunits are synthesized in the nucleus and then transported out into the cytoplasm. Ribosomes are composed of both protein and RNA, which is called rRNA, or ribosomal RNA. This rRNA is made in the nucleolus, while the mRNA and tRNA are synthesized in the nucleoplasm, which is the liquid portion of the nucleus, and that's also worth knowing for this exam. And each ribosome is made up of two pieces, or two subunits. In eukaryotes, like you and me, there's a large 60S ribosomal subunit and a small 40S ribosomal subunit, and they come together to form an 80S ribosome. And then prokaryotes, like bacteria, have a 50S ribosomal subunit and a 30S subunit that come together to form a 70S ribosome. And I also want to briefly mention here that within the 50S ribosomal subunits and prokaryotes, there's a 23S ribosomal RNA molecule. We're going to see why that's important later. Now, maybe you're scratching your head and saying, did he just say that 60 plus 40 equals 80? And 50 plus 30 equals 70? Not exactly. Those numbers refer to rates of sedimentation, not molecular weights. So they don't need to add up. Just remember that in bacteria you have a 30S and a 50S subunit, which is important because we can use different antibiotics that target those specific ribosomal subunits and prevent the bacteria from making proteins so that they die. Now, we don't want the patient to quit making proteins, just the bacteria. So, for the rest of this discussion, let's focus on prokaryotic protein synthesis so that we can talk about where these different classes of antibiotics interrupt the process. So, we're going to talk about three distinct phases of translation. Initiation, elongation, and termination. 
Initiation begins with something called initiation factors, or IFs. And they're cleverly named IF1, IF2, IF3, and so on. Initiation factors assist in the assembly of the smaller ribosomal subunit to the first tRNA molecule. So what's that smaller ribosomal subunit? Well, in eukaryotes, that would be the 40S, but we're talking about prokaryotes. So again, this is the 30S subunit. Now, you might remember that the first amino acid in a polypeptide is methionine. So we're always going to start with a methionine tRNA. And if you want to get technical in prokaryotes, it's actually formal methionine or F-methionine. So IF2 first binds to the 30S, and then it binds to the methionine tRNA. And then when the 50S comes along, and it hydrolyzes a GTP on that initiation factor, that's going to release some energy, and that allows the 50S to attach to the 30S, so now you have a complete 70S prokaryotic ribosome. And there are three sites on the ribosome complex where the tRNA can bind. There's the A site, where the incoming aminoacyl tRNA binds, A for aminoacyl. There's the P site where the polypeptide tRNA binds. This is where the growing polypeptide chain is going to be found. And P is for polypeptide. And then there's the E site, which is where the free tRNA is located right before it exits the ribosome. So E for exit. Now, the first tRNA, that F-methionine tRNA, binds at the P site rather than the A site. But all the subsequent aminoacyl tRNAs bind at the A site. So that's initiation. Now we're ready to move on to the next phase of protein translation, which is called elongation. This is where we start putting those amino acids together into a long chain, which is our polypeptide. So the incoming charged amino acyl tRNA binds the ribosome at which site? The A site. Remember, A for amino acyl. And this binding requires not initiation factors, but elongation factors, or EFs. So the initiation factors help put the ribosome together. Now the elongation factors help the incoming tRNA bind to that A site. And again, this uses a little bit of energy from GTP. So now that you have these two tRNAs side by side, one in the P site, one in the A site, there's a part of the large ribosomal subunit, that 50S subunit, that has what we call peptidyl transferase activity, which transfers the amino acid from the P site onto the amino acid at the A site. Now, in prokaryotes, this peptidyl transferase activity is found in that 23S ribosomal RNA, which is a type of ribozyme, an RNA enzyme. It's found within that 50S subunit. So the 23S rRNA transfers the peptide from the P site over to the amino acid on the tRNA in the A site. So in this case, we're just getting started, it transfers the methionine initiator onto whatever comes next, which just happens to be lysine. The next little step, which is still part of elongation, is called translocation, which is where the ribosome complex moves down the mRNA, just three nucleotides, which moves the tRNA with the growing polypeptide chain from the A site to the P site so that the process can repeat. This process also moves the newly uncharged tRNA from the P site over to the E site. Remember, E for exit. And that tRNA is going to be kicked out. It can go back and be recharged by aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. And there are a couple of players involved in translocation that you need to know about for your test. Translocation requires elongation factor G in prokaryotes and elongation factor 2 in eukaryotes. Make sure you know those. That's actually clinically important because there are a couple of bacterial toxins that work by inhibiting EF2 in host cells. There's diphtheria toxin and also exotoxin A, which is produced by Pseudomonas. So elongation just keeps going and going and going as long as there's mRNA code to translate. The new aminoacyl tRNA comes in at the A site. The 23S rRNA peptidyl transferase moves the polypeptide chain from the tRNA in the P site over to the tRNA in the A site. And then the whole thing slides over one spot and starts over. As long as the mRNA codon at the A site is valid, the ribosome is going to just keep going. But what happens when the codon at the A site is a stop codon? Remember, the three RNA stop codons are UGA, UAA, and UAG. Now, if any one of those three codons turns up, that's a signal to the ribosome that we've reached the end of the line and it's time to terminate. So this is the final step in protein translation, which is called termination. There isn't really much to know about termination. Basically, those three stop codons don't match up to a tRNA, so there's no new tRNA coming into the A site. Instead, something called a release factor binds to the mRNA, and it hydrolyzes GTP again, so this is yet another step that requires some energy. And then the new polypeptide is released from the tRNA at the P site. And then the ribosomal subunits in the tRNA all just separate from one another and they can be reused. Now, 
That polypeptide is not a fully functional protein yet. It still has to undergo some post-translational modification, which we're going to get to shortly. But before we finish translation, I want to go back and touch on where in the process each of these different protein synthesis inhibiting antibiotics work. This is also definitely worth knowing for this test. These mechanisms are also covered in the microbiology section when we talk about the antibiotics. But to go over it briefly, aminoglycosides like gentamicin bind to the 30S subunit early on, even before initiation, so that it can't pair up with that starter tRNA. There's another drug called linazolid that also inhibits initiation, but it works by binding to the 50S subunit instead of the 30S. And then tetracyclines bind to the 30S ribosomal subunit later in the process, and they prevent aminoacyl tRNA from getting to the A site. So two classes of antibiotics, the aminoglycosides and the tetracyclines, both work at the 30S subunit. The rest of these antibiotics work at the 50S subunit. We already mentioned linazolid, which binds to the 50S subunit and inhibits initiation. Chloramphenicol is an antibiotic that inhibits the peptidyl transferase part of the 50S subunit, specifically that 23S rRNA within the 50S. Macrolide antibiotics, which include drugs like erythromycin and azithromycin, these work by binding to the 50S subunit and inhibiting the translocation step. Then there's clindamycin, which sounds like a macrolide, but it's chemically different. Clindamycin is another drug that binds to the 50S subunit and blocks translocation. And there's a similar drug called lincomycin, which isn't used much, but both lincomycin and clindamycin are classified as lincosamides, and they both bind to the 50S, and they both inhibit translocation. And there's another category of antibiotics called the streptogramins that basically do the same thing. So lots of antibiotics affect the 50S subunit. Chloramphenicol, linazolid, macrolides, clindamycin, lincomycin, and the streptogramins. And then the antibiotics that affect the 30S subunit are the tetracyclines and aminoglycosides. Make sure you know that. Now, once the polypeptide is translated, there's some important post-translational processing and modification that needs to take place in order to have a protein molecule that's fully capable of doing its work, whether as an enzyme or a transcription factor, whatever. I just want to quickly mention a couple of these modifications. So the N-terminal or the C-terminal portion of the polypeptide can be trimmed. The polypeptide can be covalently modified by glycosylation or hydroxylation or phosphorylation where you're adding some molecule to specific amino acid residues. Remember, we talked about all the important post-translational modification of collagen with hydroxylation of proline and lysine residues. Sometimes polypeptides have to receive disulfide bonds or other chemical modifications that affect the three-dimensional structure and function of the protein. So the specific sequence of amino acids is called the primary structure of the polypeptide. Then they have to fold into specific secondary structures like an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Then they have to fold into tertiary and quaternary structures, all of which affect the stability of the protein and its ability to function the way it's supposed to. Now, one last thing I want to just briefly mention are some cells that are notable for making extracellular proteins. I mean, every cell has to make proteins, right? Even if it's just cellular receptors or enzymes in the cytosol. But there are some cells that are really the workhorses when it comes to protein synthesis because they make so many extracellular proteins. There are the fibroblasts, which make fibrous support connective tissue proteins like collagen and fibrillin and elastin. There are also the hepatocytes, which make all sorts of plasma proteins, everything from albumin to uh, transport proteins like hormone binding globulins, and ferritin, and haptoglobin. The liver also makes coagulation factors and fibrinogen and all those sorts of things. So the liver is a hugely important protein factory. And then one other important cell type is the plasma cells. Now, what extracellular proteins do plasma cells make? Well, plasma cells are fully matured, fully differentiated B lymphocytes that have become little antibody factories. So they're making immunoglobulins. So now you're ready for the end of session quiz. So I want you to pause the video and answer the quiz questions in your study guide, then we'll go over them together. All right, let's get going. First question, what enzyme matches amino acids to tRNA? That's aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. Next. What antibiotics are inhibitors of prokaryotic protein synthesis at the 30S ribosomal subunit? There's a mnemonic which is buy at 30, sell at 50. And the A in at is for the aminoglycosides like gentamicin and tobramycin. And then the T in at is for tetracyclines. The next question, what antibiotics are inhibitors of prokaryotic protein synthesis at the 50S ribosomal subunit? 
Again, the mnemonic is buy at 30, sell at 50. And the sell at 50 is spelled C-C-E-L-L, -L, which stands for chloramphenicol, clindamycin, erythromycin, and other macrolides like azithromycin or clarithromycin, lincomycin, and linazolid. And then there's also these streptogramins. So that's it for the end of session quiz. I'll see you next time.